Hi, I'm Billy Barkhurst, and you're watching a podcast where nostalgia comes alive. It's Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. Roll it! Welcome to Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, the podcast where nostalgia comes alive. Since July of 2021, Jake and his friends have interviewed professionals in the worlds of acting, directing, writing, puppeteering, and many more. Who will they be chatting with in this week's interview? Find out in this Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show episode. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show, where nostalgia comes alive. Happy here with us. Thank you for joining. As always, I'm your host, Jake Duffenbaugh. Who me today, as always, our co-hosts, Chris Pixby and Matt Bingle. How are you guys doing? Doing good. Doing terrific. Hello, everybody. How are you, Jakey? I'm doing great, Matt. Thank you for asking. Wonderful. Who do we have today? Today's guest we have for today. He's a puppeteer and an actor. A lot of you may know his work from Star Off from, from Sesame Street, Bear in the Big Blue House, Wobble Swerve, Dr. Seuss, and many others to real touch base on Lair. He also creates shows such as Drawing in the Sprites and Splash and Bubbles. And he's also now the current performer of Gobo Fraggle. Please welcome Mr. John Tartaglia. How about you, Johnny? How are you? Oh, thank you for having me. <laughs> Our pleasure. Awesome. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Uh, wonderful. Wonderful. Wonderful to hear. So uh, to kick things off, we know who you are, but for those who don't, would you care to, to tell your audience a bit about yourself and what you do? Sure. Well, um, I feel lucky because I've gotten to play in so many different worlds. So people kind of usually know me from one world or another. So I, I uh, started my career on Sesame Street as a puppeteer. That was my first kind of passion and love as a, as a, as a young person. Um, I started when I was 16 um, and uh, was there for, my gosh, probably like almost 10 years straight. Um, and then I started, I was also doing theater on the side. So um, I was very, very lucky when I was 25 to make my Broadway debut in Avenue Q. I was in the original company of that show. Um, and then kind of played in that world for a bit. I did, I did Beauty and the Beast on Broadway. Um, and then I got the chance to create my Disney Channel show, which was Johnny and the Sprites. Um, and that was for, I think, almost three years, two, three years. And then I got to do Shrek the Musical on Broadway. Um, and then I wrote a show off Broadway called Imagine Ocean, which a lot of people have gotten to see, thankfully. And then that got turned into a TV series called Splash and Bubbles, which is why I moved out here to Los Angeles. And now, since then, I've been working for the Jim Henson Company in a few different capacities. Um, as a as a producer, as a writer, as a director, and as a performer still, and I've had the incredible honor to uh, take over performing Gobo Fraggle from one of my heroes, the late Jerry Nelson. Um, so that that's been kind of that's the like short version of a very crazy twenty something years of my life. But um, but yeah, so so some people know me from the Broadway stuff. Some people know me from Giant the Sprite. Some people know me from Sesame Street. From you know. Bunch of different places. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Oh, terrific. So what was your background like and how did you grow up? Well, I grew up in, uh, I was born in New Jersey. Um, and my parents, my mother and father, they're divorced. But they, when, when I was born, they were together. And they both were in theater. So I grew up basically backstage. I, I My earliest memories, some of them, are of being like backstage at a theater. Um, or being in the, in the audience watching my mom or perform and my dad, my dad was a musical director. My mom is an actress and singer. So I would, you know, go to their shows and I would sit in the audience or sit backstage. And it was so impactful because I got to see at a very early age, both, you know, the magic of a performance, but also what goes into making that happen. And I got really intrigued with like special effects and, and, and fog machines and lights and how things worked. And um, so, yeah, so I, th I think it really, like looking out my career from this side of it, I'm like, oh yeah, like it totally informed where I was going to go because I was always divided between, you know, the performing side, like, you know, the being on stage and shining and, you know, singing and dancing and acting. And I also loved the making of things and how things came together and the creation. So I feel like that's where, probably why I've leaned more now towards directing and being on this side of the camera or the side of the stage. But yeah, so, so that's kind of how I started. And then um, my parents both remarried. I moved to Pennsylvania with my mother and stepfather. Um, and that really gave me a, a wonderful school that I went to that had an incredible arts program. Um, I had a, a teacher that was super influential, a theater teacher named Debbie Thompson, 
who really saw the potential in me as an actor and fostered that. And yeah, and then I was going to go to college and got the call after many crazy uh, situations to come and work on Sesame Street. And so I moved to New York at 18 and my career began. Awesome. That's wonderful. Speaking of Sesame Street, how do you kind of began working for them? Uh, it really began, I was very lucky. So I, I wrote a lot of letters when I was younger. I always tell people write letters as much as, as much as it seems like such a, you know, in the days of email and the internet, an old timey thing, it is so vital to write letters. Um, but it's a very long story, but I'll give you the short version, which is that I, I wrote a letter to Jim Henson when I was eight years old. Um, and I basically wrote him a very earnest, like, you know, eight year old letter that was like, I want to be a puppeteer and I want to work for the Muppets when I grow up. And I'm one of, when I'm 18, I'm going to move to New York city and work for the Muppets. And, uh, you know, my dream is to work with you and, and to be a part of that world. Um, I sent it off and, and didn't hear anything for a very long time. Um, and of course now as an adult, I would think, oh, he's too busy or he got the letter and just didn't respond or whatever. But as a kid, you think, oh no, it couldn't possibly be anything other than my fault. So I was like, oh, I guess he, I guess I sent the letter to the wrong address. So I literally sat down to write another letter. And I swear to God, that very day as I was doing that after school, there was a knock at the door and there was a package and it was from the Jim Henson Company. Or I think at the time it was Jim Henson Productions or Ha, maybe it was Ha, I don't remember. Uh, and there was a beautiful signed autograph picture from Jim inside and a really lovely letter from his secretary. Uh, and of course I was like, oh my God, Jim Henson like knows my name at the very least. And then um, fast forward a, a year or so, I got the, I almost was one of the kids on the new Mickey Mouse Club, the one that Justin Timberlake and Britney Spears were on to oh, interview yeah, Jim yeah. Henson. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They were going to have Jim Henson on for guest day. Um, and it was like when they when they would have like a big celebrity on and, and interview them. Um, and they would have like a real kid, not one of the Mouseketeers, but like a real kid interview one of their heroes. So I get a call at my school from this casting director at the Mickey Mouse Club. I'm like, why is she calling me? And basically she's like, oh, Jim Henson recommended you as maybe one of the kids to be to interview him. And I was like, what? So <laughs> basically like, I, you know, that blew me away. And so I had this amazing opportunity in front of me to interview Jim Henson, my hero on television and also be part of this. I love the Mickey Mouse Club. So I was super excited about that. Um, and I, I'd like compete with like 30 something other kids. I'd like send like 20 questions overnight and send a picture and like a bio, which is hilarious to think at 10 years old, what kind of a bio did I have? Um, but basically I, I sent it in and it got whittled down. It was like, you know, from 30 kids to 12 kids to five kids. And finally it was me and this other kid. And if I won, I would have flown to, I think it was Los Angeles, flown to LA and spent a day with Jim on the set of Muppet Vision 3D and gotten to, you know, ask him all my questions. Well, they, they didn't pick me. They picked another kid who I've since met, who is an awesome guy. And so it's nice to be friends with this person years later. Anyway, yeah. And so, uh, so that happened. And then, of course, Jim passed away. And then when I was 14, uh, I wrote to Kevin Clash, who performed uh, Elmo and Baby Sinclair on Dinosaurs. I was obsessed with dinosaurs. Yeah. And yeah. I basically was like, I'm a huge puppet fan. I want to be a puppeteer. I didn't know that he was casting for, for the Muppets at that time. I had no idea, but I just wrote like a fan letter and he called my mom and, and invited us to New York city to see them shoot the show. And I was so excited. So I went to New York city. I was getting my dream. I was getting to see the, the Muppets live, see Sesame street live. And it turns out, uh, well, during lunch, I said, I said, you know, I'm so thankful that you invited us, but why did you call? Like, you know, you get so many letters. And he said, oh, I recognized your name. Jim used to talk about you. And oh, I remember the gosh. floor just dropped out. I was like, what? <laughs> and so, and I've since had conversations with his former assistant, Jim's former assistant, who basically was like, that sounds like Jim. Um, so I never, it all is that to say, I never got to meet Jim. Um, of course, but I always say that in a very magical way, I'm here because of him. I have this amazing career because of him. Um, and I, that's why I always tell people, write letters <laughs> because you never know. <laughs> right. um, but, but yeah, and so and so that started my my time with the Muppets. And basically like I, I went to, they used to have these um, these things called workshops, which I think they still do, but 
where basically they they bring you in and you you are with you know a group of people like you know i think at that time it was big it was like 40 50 people and uh it was like a three-day process and basically over those three days they would kind of whittle it down and cut it down Mm -hmm. um which was really scary like looking back it was very like a chorus line like you're like on the line of getting cut you know um and i would always somehow stay i always make it to the very end and and i think it's because i was you know i was very i was young and i wasn't great at voices yet and i wasn't great at characters but i because of my theater skills i was really good at choreography and really good at manipulation and this was the time when like sesame street was expanding this was like the around the corner time it was just about to happen oh, and yeah. it was like a giant new <laughs> set with, and they needed to populate with more puppeteers so they were hiring they needed new, new people and so I think I just fell in at the right time and, and, you know, it was when there was a need for new people. And, um, and I was good at, at the lip sync. I was good at following choreography. So all those big group numbers I was helpful for. So it was a very, I was just a very, very lucky person at that time to, to, I always say, I think it was just meant to be that it happened at the time that it happened. But yeah, that's how I, that's how it all started. So, so that's really wonderful. indirectly uh, Jim Henson is responsible. I feel like for, for my career. Definitely. And um, uh, in, in terms of uh, Sesame Street, like what are some of your favorite like episodes or inserts you got to do? Um, gosh. Well, I feel, you know, one of the really cool things I got to do, I mean, it, I haven't thought about that for a while, but I something that just came to my mind instantly was uh, Jeff Moss, who wrote so many of the classic, you know, Sesame Street songs that we know and love. Um, one of the last things he did was a, a new song, and I'm gonna get it wrong. You guys will figure out what it's called because I, I know you're gonna figure this out. But I think it was called Badoodly Dumb. Oh yeah, yeah. Like, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. Yes. Yeah. And I got to puppeteer on that, and I remember it was a big group number with a lot of puppets, and it was like all of us were called that day, um, and it was really really cool to like you know do a Jeff Moss brand new original song because he hadn't written a new song for the show for a while, so that was really cool. Um, I got to assist Frank Oz when he was still there puppeteering. We did some monster piece theaters and I got to do his right hand for that. And that was both, you know, as a very young, excited puppeteer, both uh, horrifying and exciting at the same time. And he was wonderful. He was so great. Uh, but I was like, oh my God, I'm right handing Cookie Monster for monster piece theater. It was a big deal. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I feel like I feel like I just I just got to do you know it was it was a really exciting time at the show because there was there was you know it was like when the Rosie O'Donnell show was big so we were doing a lot of appearances on that and there was a lot of you know uh, we were doing commercials and we shot this 4D film for Japan which is now I think at Universal Studios Orlando or was uh, we did this like Sesame Street 4D film and I got to work on that so it was just it was just this time of like uh, just a lot of opportunity. You know, and I and I got a lot of on the job training from that. Um, but I would say, yeah, I, I think that those moments stand out uh, pretty strongly. I'm trying to think of other but things. You know, it was also I'll say really quickly, like it was also uh, a magic time because it was so many of the original people were still there. So you know, Carol Spinney was there, Jerry was there. You know, um, you know, Dave Goals would come in and do some some days every now and then. Um, you know, and, and I, obviously everybody else, you know, so it was just, it was just like this magical pocket of time that I feel really, really lucky I got to be part of. Absolutely. One of my favorite episodes that you did was the uh, service dog episode. Brandeis. Yes. 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 Yeah. Really proud of that. Thank you. I was really proud of that character. And uh, the writer, Emily Pearl Kingsley, uh, uh, she was always so kind to me and she was so complimentary and oh yeah yeah that was a really really special mm -hmm. episode i was i was very proud of that one i loved that puppet the puppet was beautiful yes absolutely oh, yeah. and emily's a previous guest oh nice she's i think she's magic i really do she's yes. just a magic she really is. She's yeah wonderful. she's the best yeah she's yeah. wonderful yeah absolutely wonderful so so i'm curious also who were your, some of your favorite celebrity guests that you got to work with on sesame Ooh. That's a good question. You know, it's one of the things that like, it, it there's no ramp up to that, right? Like it's like literally like your first day on set sometimes is a celebrity guest and that's exactly what it was for me. Um, so I got to work, I mean, I loved working, uh, Charles Durning with Santa Claus for uh, the uh, Elmo Saves Christmas. 
yeah. and that, that yeah, was really that's cool because of course the Muppet movie right like a huge fan of his uh mm-hmm. Maya Angelou was in that so I got to work with Maya Angelou uh Whoopi Goldberg was wonderful Gloria Estefan was wonderful um there was I, I I'm assuming you guys know who Noah Wiley is he was on that show ER yeah, yeah. Um, it was huge at the, the name time sounds familiar yeah you, if you saw him you'd be like that guy he's amazing he's an incredible actor and uh unbelievably kind i remember the reason i remember him so much is because he came on set and saw big bird's nest and just started weeping like had this like oh, beautiful like uh, he was like oh. i cannot believe i'm on sesame street you know um i got to i got to work with uh uh beyonce and and uh, destiny's child i actually got to choreograph them yeah which was just yes. crazy uh that was really crazy and um oh, it was so good right yeah. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, man, I got a new way to walk. Uh, the Dixie Chicks were amazing. Um, uh, God, I mean, I'm even saying this, I'm like, Jesus, that's crazy. Uh, you know, uh, Michael, Michael Stipe and REM, and uh, um, who else was on? My God, I. It was really. It was really. That was that was an incredible part of it. Oh, I got Kofi Annan, who was the, the head of the UN at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just. It was just such a. That was such a magical experience. But was what was funny is. Uh, and of course, Rosie, we did a lot of stuff with Rosie. Um, you know, watching people who are at that time, especially at the height of their careers and like, you know, were, were these massive stars, how humbling it was for them to be on the show and how it was kind of neat because it was almost like, like they would come and watch what we were doing and they were, they were complimentary and, and in awe of us. Meanwhile, we we're in awe of them. So there was this kind of mutual fascination of of the of our worlds you know but it was beautiful to watch people come on the set and just talk about how much the show meant to them actually one of my really favorite things i'll tell you really quickly is um it's such a special thing for me was rosemary clooney was on and i I don't i don't think she i i think it was one of the last things she did i'm not i don't want to say that to be certain but i i don't think she was around for much longer after that but you know rosemary clooney growing up as a kid in you know an italian household with a father who loves opera and loves classic Broadway like her voice was very present in my life as a kid and so I getting to work with her was really neat and she did this beautiful uh I think she sang the Sesame Street theme if I if I remember correctly and you know it was all these puppets it was wonderful and and I was she was sitting on the, the steps of one two three in between takes and like you know everyone was kind of busy doing their thing and she was kind of there alone so I went over to her and I was like I had this beautiful conversation with her, like a 20 minute conversation. She was so nice and talked about the business. And she just, she, she just reminded me, and I've remembered this to like really appreciate it and how fast things go by and how difficult of a business it can be, but how wonderful it can be. And, you know, when you read about her career, you read about, read about her life, hearing those words directly from her in a very quiet moment was really special. And then she signed a, a, the scripts to my dad and wrote something lovely like like your son is one of a kind or something like that love rosemary which i just think was um, so sweet so that just little magical moments like that i was i felt very lucky to have those definitely and um so speaking of kevin clash because i know you mentioned uh, working with him a bit earlier um i know you also got to work on the original elmo's world segment yes what was working on that like you know no one knew what this was going to be i mean it was so funny because it was it was like you know shooting it was really hard because it's all blue screen right so you're just in front of this like you know very small three wall blue screen set for days and days and days and days and days and and nothing is there that you know it's you know i think i think yes we would see we would see the background on the camera on the monitor but you know it's 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 like it's a very kind of from a from a shooting television point of view, it's a very kind of boring setup because you're just on a blue wall all day. Um, what was really cool about it though was it was very early graphics time. I think it was like 94, 95, I think when we did the first ones. I could be wrong. But you know, so people we were still learning about like how this all works. And and we would have these like uh, uh to make like the um the what was it like like the, the table? Yeah, and right. The table, yeah, was, yeah I, I, I forget where they were, they were objects. We had these like it was again very early days before like full body motion capture and everything you can do now and CG being the norm. We had these like pieces of foam rubber that had little sensors on them, and we would basically puppeteer the foam rubber 
and that would translate to the thing on screen. So like if we were performing like the, the TV, for example, like I would hold like a block of foam with the sensors on it and bounce it around, you know, and basically that's what you would see on screen. So that was kind of, I mean, looking back now, it was very like, like, you know, high tech. Now, of course, it feels very like, you know, rudimentary, but at the time it was like super high tech. Um, and we would have like a slider thing to make the drawer slide out. And I don't know, it was, it was, it was fun. I mean, it was just, it was a very, you know, it, I don't think we thought that it would be this massive, massive thing. And then when it's, when it premiered and people loved it, it became like, you know, the focus of the show. People just like want, loved Elmo's World so much. And so we, of course, did a, a bunch more. And then they got, we got really creative when we started doing all these ridiculous, silly, you know, Elmo turning into fish and weird characters and stuff like that. Yeah, um, yeah. But I'm, but I'm, I'm really thankful though that that segment happened during my first few years there because it gave me a lot of really focused time on camera, you know, because it was just five of us, I think, that, that did all those segments. Um, and it was, it was like really focused puppeteering time. And I got to really make a lot of mistakes and learn and, you know, and be with this, be with the crew and like for a long time. And it was just, it was a really important part of my puppeteer development. Um, but it was cool. We, but we had no idea. We had no idea. I remember I was always really concerned about the goldfish <laughs> that played Dorothy. Right. Because, because, you know, after a while, like we're so used to seeing goldfish be so active, but after a while, like, you know, they, they, they do sleep and they do kind of get still. And so I'd always be like, is it dead? Like, I was so worried. <laughs> I was always concerned about Dorothy, but she was, she was fine. <laughs> as long as she was fine. Yeah, right. <laughs> She's fine. She's fine. Yeah. She's fine. She's fine. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> so uh, you also worked on the Sesame Street spinoff, Play With Me Sesame, performing Ernie for the second season. What was that like? Yeah. Um, it was scary. <laughs> I, I had very, very little notice that I would be playing Ernie. I did not uh, know that that was going to happen. Uh, so it was a few, literally like a few days before I was going to assist um, on the show. And then I got asked to play Ernie. So um, I'd, I'd always done an Ernie imitation and I performed him in the, the, the Thanksgiving Day Parade. And I, I did it for the 4D movie. I did Ernie for that. Um, so yeah, it was just kind of like a like a what kind of last minute thing. I think it was it was a fun project though because they'd never really done a, a spin-off like that. Like it was it was it was this weird situation to like have these characters not on Sesame Street but operating in the same way and as the same characters but in a completely new environment with a completely new format. Yeah. Um and the the head person on that like I'm blanking on her name but she was so nice um was so like supportive and patient with me and like you know like I was very worried about getting it right because I was obviously performing this iconic character who was one of my favorites and um and I was just I was so nervous the whole time I just remember being nervous that's like the feeling I, I can remember I remember like I would like you know have a bagel for breakfast or whatever I'd just be like feeling like I was gonna throw up for the rest of the day because I was like oh my god like I'm doing Ernie on I'm playing Ernie. Like I was so petrified the whole time, but it was a really, it was a really cool experience to be part of that. Yes, absolutely. One one of the favorite things I I wait what Ernie did for playing me Sesame. I know you two will not be surprised for me mention it, but um, where okay, he did yeah. like where he did like Ernie says. Oh gosh, yeah, I forgot about that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. Yeah, surprised. there were uh, <laughs> that was fun. Not there were surprised. a lot of fun segments. There, there was uh, yeah, they were. basically Ernie was like, Pigeon "Here patterns. we go, go." <laughs> I just, I just I go all over, please. Oh, yeah. no, I remember it now. I remember it was very physical, right? It was like he was like, yeah, yeah. uh huh. Yeah, 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 he was like yeah. back yes. and forth. Like yeah. back as a front, and then he's going to left and right, and he keeps on holding it. Yeah, and it falls down. Was... Basically, basically, in a sense, his own that. version of near and far, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. basically. Right. Yeah, I remember the, the the first thing that comes back to me when you say that is that I I can remember doing it, but I also remember being tired all the time from it. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. Was the physical? <laughs> yeah. Very physical. Yeah. Definitely. I bet. <laughs> So moving on from Sesame Street, you also puppeteered on some other series, including Bear the Big Blue House and the Webby's World of Dr. Seuss. Yes. Uh, what was it like? What was it like working on those? So it's interesting. So Webby's World of Dr. Seuss was actually my very even before 
Sesame Street officially, it was my first like long-term job. So Sesame Street, I was doing days on, I was getting called in. And then um, I, if I remember correctly, I got booked on Sesame Street when I was 18, when I was moving to New York City for that season, but we hadn't started shooting yet. But, but the first thing up, I think, and I might be making this all up, was the Webbyless World of Dr. Seuss. And we shot it in uh, what's called the Carriage House, which is this you know small studio uh, in New York City where Jim shot a lot of things. Um, and so it was really cool to, to shoot it there because there's so much history in that room of like what had been shot in that studio. And so, I mean, it's a tiny little studio. Um, and it was also shot all on blue screen. But what was crazy about it was this was this was literally the early, early, early days of computer graphics. And it was the first that I know of, the first series that combined puppets and animated backgrounds with CG. Um, and and so, and they had figured out that, you know, how to move the camera and have the, the scenery move with it and we could interact with it. Um, but it felt, again, like the Elmo's World self, it felt very like, ooh, we're so like technically able. Um, and uh, and it was cool that it was the Dr. Seuss characters because I loved those characters growing up. So that was just neat to go to work every day and, you know, have the cat in the hat there in Horton. But I was, I was you know, assisting and, and I was petrified, you know, because it was just like a lot of people that I wanted to work with. And actually it was the first time I had any sort of like fraggle interaction because Kathy Mullen was on the first season and was the puppet captain and of course was the original Moki Fraggle and Cotter Inducer. and so I was just in awe all the time of working with Kathy and I learned, yeah. I learned so much from her so much from watching her and I, I remember this I I, uh, I lived about 20 blocks north actually I learned two big things I, I lived about 20 blocks north of where we shot and um, which was great because in the morning I would get up and I would walk to work and it was a nice way to wake up and walk to work and um, I think I had gone out, you know, I was 18, right? So I was 18, I was stupid. I like, you know, wasn't responsible. And I got, I went out and I think I had met a friend for dinner and then we went to go see a movie. And, you know, I, I was out to like midnight something and we had to be at work at like seven in the morning. And I, I forgot to set my alarm. I was so tired. I forgot to set my alarm. So, you know, and, and when, you know, on a set like that, everyone is so important. You need everyone there. So mm -hmm. I, you know, seventh, and this is back when people had landlines and, you know, like, I don't, I don't think I had a cell phone. Um, <clears throat> and like, you know, all of a sudden, like 7.15, my phone starts ringing, my phone starts ringing. I thought it was my alarm. So I ignored it at first because I was so tired. And then I finally went out and I was like, oh, it's my phone. I picked up and I was like, hello. And they're like, where are you? And I was like, <gasps> and I looked at my <laughs> I, I totally overslept. So I like, I, I don't think I've ever run faster in my life. And I got there and I was sweating. I ran 20 blocks in New York City, like pushing people over to get there. Right, um, yeah. But right. I, it was a big <laughs> lesson about like, like, you know, you, ha you have to be responsible. And like, you know, I, I yeah. know I set like three alarms. Mm -hmm. I never, never want to miss my, I never want to oversleep. Um, the other really um, funny thing was, you know, uh, we would shoot late sometimes because it just, you just have to get the work done. And it was a very hard show, technically. There was a lot of, because of the, the background stuff, it just took a long time to shoot. And I remember it was like Friday night and it was like getting later and later and later and later. And literally it was like 12.45 in the morning and we were still shooting. Um, and I remember like, you know, again, 18, I was sitting in the, in the, in the green room on a break and I was kind of complaining about it. I was like, oh my God, it's just, I'm so tired, it's so late. And Kathy was like, I'm so glad she said that. She was like, well, we used to shoot until dawn on Frog Rock sometimes. She's like, so you better get used to it if you want to do this. And I walked out. And I was like, and it, and she was right. Like, that's that's the job. Like, that's the job. And um, and that is true. Sometimes they would shoot until, they would call it do's or dawn. Because they would shoot, like, so late into the, the next day. But um, it definitely, you know, I had a lot of, like, life lessons that happened on that set. So I'm very thankful for that. And I really give Kathy credit for you know, I was I was always there and always showing up for the fun side of it. But she really yeah. she taught me a lot about like the work side and the professionalism side and like what you have to how hard the work the work is and that that's part of the job that's part of the of being a professional. Um, and Bear, I only did a few days on Bear. Um, I auditioned for the show. I, I was actually one of the first the or one of the, one of the final people for Trilo, um, and I'm so happy that Tyler got it because Tyler took it 
exactly where it needed to go and was so brilliant as Trilo. Um, but that was exciting to get that far, you know, at that age, I was, I was still, I think it was 18 or 19 when Bear came out. Um, but, uh, uh, but they welcomed me on the set and I got to do like, you know, one of Tutter's cousins, I think in something. And uh, I think I would, uh, one day I think I filled in for Pip and Pop for something. And it was just, it was really cool. It was a wonderful set to work on. It was, it was a really fun set. I remember no beautiful show. Oh my God. It was so beautiful. And and it was so different from like, like a Sesame street, you know, because it was, it was, you know, raised up like all of the old Muppet sets were. And, and um, just the detail in that set was gorgeous, you know, and, and I loved all the little rooms and and all the little trap doors and the, and the floors and stuff. It was, it was a really, that was a really fun set. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, you're also a puppeteer on the Book of Pooh, which used tabletop yeah. puppetry. Can you talk about working with that kind of style of puppetry? Yeah, that was another, like, you know, everyone was kind of figuring out as we went along. Um, I mean, it was a big deal in the sense of, like, it was the first time, like, those very iconic Disney characters were being realized as puppets. So that was that was cool. And it was, you know, the original voices from the animated versions of the characters. So, you know, they, the, the main puppeteers would get a track and, you know, they have to basically memorize the track and lip sync to the track, which I think was really tough. That was a very hard job for them. I just remember my image of that, you know, you get flashes of images. My image of that is like the puppeteers in the green room, just constantly with their earphones in, just doing this and like trying to get the dialogue down because it was a lot. Um, we shot it in a very, very small studio. Um, and and it was hard, you know. Tabletop puppetry is is such a, a a specialized thing, and it's and it's everyone excels at something different. Some people, of course, are incredibly good at this, and some people are brilliant at hands, and some people are really good with feet. Um, and I think each character had a set team for the most part. Um, so I when I would go in, it was just to either fill in for somebody because they were doing something else, or if it was like a big group scene, they needed like extra puppeteers to kind of you know have all the characters on screen. Um, but it was, I remember it was the thing that was exciting at the time was they had made these new green suits, uh, green screen suits that had like, like diamonds in them or something like, or like super, super, super small reflective stones or something that I guess would reflect the light back so that you wouldn't get as many shadows. So it was easier to get rid of the performers and post I just remember everyone being really excited about that and like, you know, and like, and that they were heavier, the suits, because they had this like special sparkly material in it. Right. Um, but yeah, but that was a really, that was hard. I mean, sometimes you'd have like, you know, nine puppeteers in a very, very small, small, small space in a very hot studio. <laughs> um, so I just remember, and I think we shot it over the summer. So I remember it being hot in the studio, but, um, but it was cool. It was, the final product was beautiful. It was really beautiful. Definitely. Oh yeah. So, moving on to uh, Johnny and the Sprites, which this is like a, this is your life, by the way. I'm like, I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> I'm tired listening to it. I'm like, my god, how old am I? Anyway. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So, moving on to Johnny and the Sprites, which first I'm going to say that was one of my favorite shows growing up. Thank you. I absolutely yes. love that show. Love so, that show so much. Wonderful and show. And because I know, in addition to uh, starring in it, you also created it. What kind of went into the creation process? Oh my gosh. Well, it was really funny. So I was doing Avenue Q and Rich Ross, who was at the time the president of the, of the Disney Channel, <clears throat> came to see the show and wrote a letter, really lovely letter that was basically like, I'd love to, you know, I'm a fan. I'd love to have dinner and talk about, you know, future possibilities. And and this is horrible. And I laugh about it now. I'm, I'm, I'm horrified by it. But I was, we were so busy that time of, of uh, you know, when you open a Broadway show, it's just like, thing after thing after thing you're doing this appearance and that talk show and this thing and you're recording the album and you know and it's no excuse but it was a really really intense time and i got the letter and i was so excited and i put it on my my dressing room table and it got buried by other stuff just other stuff on top of it and i just forgot about it and you know which if there's one thing i can give anyone who loves this business advice it's do not ever miss an opportunity because it usually doesn't come around again but because he was so uh, thoughtful, he wrote another letter, like a few weeks later, that was like, maybe you didn't get my first letter. And I was like, <gasps> um, and so we had dinner and, you know, he was very complimentary about uh, Avenue Q and, and saw my resume that I worked on Sesame Street and I'd done all these other, you know, kid shows. And he said, have you ever thought about creating your own show? And I thought, well, yeah, of course. Like, you know, I thought when I was 60 years old, I would maybe win the lottery and, and, 
use the money to make my own show. You know, I, I didn't, under, I didn't think about pursuing that, you know, I was 25 at the time, you know, so I just, it wasn't on my radar. Um, but I always thought about it. I always dreamt about it. And he said, well, would you want to create something for Disney channel? And I was like, Oh, Oh, you mean like actually do it. Um, and so he's like, well, go off and think about what you want it to be. And we'll set up another meeting. And, and I, um, immediately thought about this idea I had had when I was 15. Um, obviously very, very much inspired by Fraggle Rock for sure. But I wanted to create, I loved, I loved anything, whether it was, you know, Muppets or Henson or, or Disney or anything. I love anything that takes you to a different world. I just, I love that. I love that immersion inside of a different world, you know, uh, you know, Lord of the Rings or, or Harry Potter, anything like that. I love that. So I had this idea about these these sprites that lived in a forest and were secret and um, you know were were involved with nature and were involved with that stuff. Um, and so I I written this down when I was like fifteen. I wrote like ginger and basil, and I, that was all I wrote. It was like one sprite named ginger, one one named basil. They live in the woods, and that's kind of like the most. And I remember that I was like, <gasps> and I I somehow found. I used to save a lot of stuff. I found that notebook in my closet. I would saved it. And I found that notebook and I was like, it's kind of a cool idea. So I, I told Rich about it. He thought it was cool. And that was the beginning of it. And then I brought, you know, I, I talked with uh, Joe Gluckson and Louise Pico and Michael Schubach and Daryl Winslow, like all the, all the wonder Watson, all the wonderful uh, uh, co-creators of the show. We all kind of came together and contributed so much to that. And uh, that team, I mean, that's really where the show that you got to see came from. I had the initial idea, but they were the ones that all together, we all really found it. Um, and and it was really funny. So I was not in the show originally. It was just going to be the show about sprites. And Jill Gluckson, actually, to her uh, amazing credit, one day was like, you know, you need to be in the show. And I was like, what? She's like, yeah. She's like, that's why, that's why he wanted you to make a show is because he saw you perform. He wants you to be on camera. You need to be in the show. It needs to be Johnny and the Sprites. And so that's really where it all came from. And I was like, huh, I legit had never thought of putting myself in the show. I really didn't. Um, so I give Jill total credit for that. And then from there, from there, we just started coming up with everything. Lily and Root and this world and that he's a musician and, and lives in this cabin. And um, yeah, it was just, it was, it was a really... It was such an exciting opportunity to bring people together that I really loved and that I loved working with and that had meant a lot to me, um, you know, and, and people who I just thought were so good at what they do, you know, like Leslie and, and Carmen and Heather and Tim and getting Stephen Great Schwartz people. to write the theme song, you know, which was like, a, a, a you know, when he said yes, I thought I was going to pass out. I was like, really? You're going to write the theme song for my TV show? Okay. Um but it was just, it was just a, uh, the, it was a, it was a project of love. It was, it was really made with love and, and really made with um, dedication to doing something different and, and hard work. And, you know, I learned a lot being, that's my first time ever producing anything. Um, and I learned a lot about, you know, a leader's role. I learned a lot about, you know, uh, the responsibility you have on the energy on a set. I learned a lot about, you um, you know, when there's conflict, how to resolve it in a way that everyone feels heard. Um, it was it was a really big learning lesson for me, that show. Um, and and it means a lot when I watch it. And, it, it, you know, I, 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 I'm really proud of it. I'm proud of what we were able to do. Um, and I wish it had gone on longer. It was really sad when we didn't get renewed for a third season. But um, I'm proud of what we were able to do. I really am. Definitely. Really is there a lot of the episodes and songs are just terrific uh do you have any favorite episodes or songs or both even oh wow i mean i really really loved our um holiday episode i thought that was so much yeah, it's very sparkly holiday yeah that was uh, a good one. That's, oh, yeah. that's that's so yeah. special for so many reasons and i you know, I, I, I love all those wonderful classic holiday specials I grew up watching. I mean, but, you know, of course, like Muppet Family Christmas and Emmett Otter and, and Fraggle Rock and all those. I love them. But I really, really have always loved um, like all like the variety show specials from like the 60s and 70s. And like, you know, they're just capturing that warmth, that kind of like Andy Williams sweater, Christmassy, glowy warmth. Um and we just wanted to make a special episode that felt inclusive of everybody. And um, I love the idea that the Sprites had this holiday too. And 
um, that one was just so special. We covered the whole set with snow. I think it was the last thing we shot of the first season, if yeah. I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I love, I love you guys know that. Thank you. I don't remember. Um, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. You're like it was, and you shot it on November. No. Um, and, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if you guys knew that. If you were like, you no, shot it, no, you wrapped it. Fine. He I'm might. The one, I'm the he one might. Right, so. He might. I. We the rest of the stuff. <laughs> No, but it was it was special. I, and I, I, you know, I have this uh, Leslie Carrara Rudolph and I are very close, and and we, we are like brother and sister. And and you know, Leslie. she has this. She, oh, she's the best, right? Have you guys talked yes. to her? Oh yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. Yes, yes we did. She's a great friend of ours. Yeah. Very sweet. Very she's, sweet. She's, she's the greatest, sweet. right? Um, yes. I, 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 and she says hello, by the way. Oh, I love her. I miss her so much. She um she has the saying that I love. It's really it's it's. I'm, I'm glad that um. She's introduced it into my life because it, it's made me more present in moments where I, it'd be easy to not take it in. But she has this wonderful saying where she where she'll grab you during like a magical something that's happening, whether it's like you're watching, you know, the Main Street Electrical Parade at Disneyland together, which we've done, or like, or we're or we're working with an amazing celebrity, or we're on the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade float, and she'd grab you and be like, "We'll always have this moment," and I love that because it, it's it's such a good reminder of like of of you know. It may not last, but you'll always have that memory. And I remember when we were shooting the final, that beautiful shot at the end of that of a Sprightly Holiday, where we're pull, where the sprites are like on the picnic bench outside with all the snow and all the lights are on the house. And they pull, we pull back and see the whole thing. It's, I mean, it was magic. And I remember her saying that right before we shot. And I got so like clenched throat, teary eyed. And, and that's the take that we use. Is like you can just see it in my face. But it was such a it was such a moment of like take it in and like enjoy like and that because it was the end of our first season it was like we may not come back next year right you never you have no guarantee of of a, another season so I thought I'm just gonna take this moment in and enjoy that so that that sticks out big time to me. The other thing is she, it's another Leslie moment. She has this. I'm sure she's introduced you to her, and if not, then I'm glad to be the one to do it. She has this little plastic guinea pig named Gail. Has she talked about Gail? I don't think so. I don't think so. I'm no, shocked she hasn't told you about it. She has this. this Come on, Leslie. Why did you yeah. <laughs> let you guys down? Yeah, she has this <laughs> plastic guinea pig named Gail, who it literally is just a plastic guinea pig. And she, if you watch Shining the Sprites, I think second season too, but definitely first season, she hid Gail in every single shot. There is oh, a wow. plastic guinea pig hidden every single shot and sometimes it was the most random like you know sometimes it was not obvious if you're like way in the background on the stairs or something like that but it was in every single shot but the, the thing i remember is we were doing one episode and i can't i can't tell you which one it was but it, i was i had to like knead dough and and I, <laughs> I i was in my dressing room and so i was, it was there was some reason i was we were delayed I, I was delayed coming to set i was on a call or something was happening and they were waiting they were waiting so finally i came out and we jumped right into it and I'm kneading the dough and I'm doing the scene and I realize that Gail's in the dough. She put the, the, the guinea pig in the dough. And, and, I, and I just was like, and I hear like, the, there's a moment, I don't know if it was the final take we used, but, the, but there was a moment where like, I'm doing this kneading and I kind of stopped because I felt this hard lump in the dough. And I hear right below, you know, camera where Leslie is, I hear her go, just a little teeny like snort laugh. And I'm just like, I'm not gonna, I was like, she wants me to laugh and break, but I'm not gonna do it. So I kept, I kept going and I finished the scene. And afterwards I was like, you put Gail in the dough. Um, so there's that, that kind of silliness. And oh, man. actually one, one other really funny thing I'll tell you guys, uh, when we were shooting, do you remember the, the episode where uh, uh, Johnny turns into a mud troll? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. yes, yes, yes. So we had this whole discussion about like, well, what, we, we're not gonna use real mud. So what could it be? And so the amazing props department came out. Do you know the story? Have you heard the story? It's crazy. Mm-hmm. They came up with this like, like consistent, it was like oatmeal mixed with like chocolate syrup mixed with some gelatin, I think, and something else. So it looked really, it looked good. It smelled good actually. Um, because they knew I was going to be in it for so long that they was like, let's, let's make it something that's like not going to, you know, be disgusting on your skin, but also like that, you know, you can, you can wash off easily. Okay. So I'm in there. Well, two things. One is what we didn't think about was the fact that what happens when you leave like oatmeal out? It congeals, right? It gets really yeah. thick. 
So, yeah. you know, the, the first like 20 minutes was so much fun. I was just like flopping around and making people laugh by being disgusted. And then like two hours into that episode, you know, because it takes a long time to shoot an episode. Two hours in that episode, I was like, wow, this is really hard to move in. I swear to you, by the end of the day, and I'm not exaggerating, it took five people to pull me out of it because it had congealed so much. It was almost like cement. It was like, I could oh, not. No. It was the weirdest. I can't even describe it. It was the weirdest feeling. It was like, I could not move my own body. Oh, and so no. they had to like get like five crew guys. So that was funny. And then at this point in the afternoon, when it's like, you really can't get out of it yourself, the fire alarm goes off. Oh, God. <laughs> and everyone leaves. They left. <laughs> What? <laughs> and I think everyone assumed that, you know, I just, I like everyone else, I just get up and walk. But I was, <laughs> luckily, there were a few people that were, I was like, hello, can someone please come <laughs> I was really just like stuck <laughs> in this oh, vat of mud and I could not get out. So whenever I watch that episode, all I think about is how much it hurt to move and the fact that I was almost, you know, left, left to die. But, um, but I, you know, it was, it was a funny moment. We all laughed about that. But yeah, lot, there was lots of great moments on that show. It was a very, very tight cast. A very like we, we were all just very. I don't know. I, I feel like I just remember laughing so much. And and uh, and I one more thing I'll say is uh, uh my mom was on an episode of the show, and it was the first time we ever got to work together, and that was really really special. She played Mother Nature, and yeah, so have, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. yes, and that was uh, one of the last we shot that. I think second to last and it was so so she got to be there for the rap party with my stepfather and it was sad because we knew that we, were, that we weren't going to get picked up again so it was kind of like a, another you know we'll always have this moment moment of you know knowing that I was getting to, to perform with my mom and you know that they were there for this you know final moment on this in this chapter of something that was very special to me so that that was really cool great definitely yeah, yeah it's just so, such a wonderful yeah. show and um and you actually also uh perform on this bright sage what's it like in to perform him oh he was like my outlet you know because it, <laughs> because it was it was it was you know being on camera was you know there was a lot of responsibility on that being the producer was hard because i had to you know be a producer sage was like when i could put that puppet on and just be a complete idiot and you know he was always ad-libbing we were always saying funny things and and uh and it was also a time when it was like, you know, I, I got to I got to be back in the element that I knew so well. So it was kind of like, you know, I got to play with the with the puppeteers and and they would give me, they tease me all the time because, you know, it was like, you know, oh Johnny, like especially Tim Lagasse, he would give me so much stuff. He'd be like, Oh, like so glad that you could like come down here and like, join the puppeteers and then you know and stuff like that. But I I I loved I loved doing Sage. And I thought he was just so sweet and such a fun character. Oh, yeah. Well originally he was actually gonna be uh like as if he had like grown into the tree. Like he was basically gonna be like as if like he was like like almost like Mother Willow from like uh, Pocahontas like part okay, but then yeah. but, hmm. but obviously he became more mobile in the second season. But uh but no I loved doing him. I thought he was so much fun. That's wonderful. Absolutely. So moving on uh, to your work with the Jim Henson company, this is kind yep. of more of a deep cut question. What was it like working on Animal Jam? Oh my gosh. Well, that was, um, that was really, uh, talk about, you know, an unexpected crazy moment. Uh, I got a call from John Kennedy, who was the puppet oh, captain. John, he's great. I love John. Mm-hmm. Yes. You talked to John too? He's the yeah, best. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Yes, we have. He, he is the best. Um, he called me on a Friday, I think it was. And was like, and they'd known that I wanted to work on the show because I knew they were going to shoot in Orlando and I'm a huge Disney World fan. So, you know, when I heard that the show was going to happen, I was like, oh my God, like I want to work on it. And then it didn't work out and it was fine. Um, And so he called me on a Friday and he was like, hey, what are you doing right now? And I was, I think at the time I was unemployed. I was like, oh, nothing, you know? And this is like, I think it was like April or May. Um, And I, the next like job job I knew I had was like September. And I was like, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, kind of get ready for the summer. But he's like, great. Um, can you be on a plane to work by Monday and possibly stay here for like the next three months? And I was like, what? And basically, they made a shift in casting, and he was basically, like, can you get down here like tomorrow? So it was crazy. I had roommates at the time, and I, I, I remember I hung up, and I was like, yeah, I'm in. 
And, oh, and he said, but you know, the only thing is because it, this position was originally gonna be a local position, um, you're gonna have to work locally, which means that, you know, that I wasn't housed, I, I wasn't gonna be paid to get down there. And I was so excited to work at, in Disney World, like shooting on a soundstage at MGM Studios at the time and, and work in Orlando and just have a job. I was like, sure, no problem. So I literally packed my bag and I called Disney World and I found a room they, they thought it was crazy. I was like, I need a room I can live in for the next three months. And they're like, you mean, <laughs> you mean like three weeks? It's like, no, three months. And I stayed at like the Pop Century Resort or one of those like pop music resort. Um, and yeah, I was there for three months or whatever it was that we shot and got down there and was starting work on Monday. And it was so much fun. It was so much fun. Uh, and that was actually, I think that was the first series I worked on with Leslie. Um, but it was a really great group of people and it was it was a fun show to shoot because it was it was I think we were on the same soundstage they shot the Mickey Mouse Club on so that kind of was cool for my nerd history I was like oh that's fun um and, and it was neat to like be in the park working and we got to like drive backstage at MGM Studios past like Catastrophe Canyon behind the scenes and all those cool things um and then in between when we weren't needed we would go ride rides so we would just like literally like you know they'd be like oh you guys aren't needed for the next three hours we'd be like bye we go into the park and ride like the Tower of Terror and rock and roller coaster. In fact, actually, there was one moment when Leslie, again, another Leslie moment, we had like an hour free. Um, I think it was like, it wasn't lunch, but it was something like where we knew we had like a dedicated hour. And we're like, let's go ride Tower of Terror. She's like, okay. And th they wouldn't walk us on. We still had to wait in line with the guests. And we get on, we had plenty of time. And we get to the point, I don't know if you've written Tower of Terror, but like the, the part where it goes horizontal before the big, drop, the big drop. And we get into the drop chamber and it stops. The ride stops. Oh. All the, and all the lights come Oh. Off. And we're like, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And uh, yeah, and we were there for, on that, like sitting there for like a good 20, 25 minutes. And I was like, we're going to get fired. <laughs> but luckily it was like, 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 it was like, let's say it was one o'clock. We had to be back. It was like, 1252 like the ride started working we did the drops and we ran back to the studio but it, that was really fun it was fun to be in the park um you know and you would hear the fireworks going off or phantasmic happening as you were leaving for the night it was it was a really that was a really cool experience um again learned a lot doing that show i learned a lot being on camera and um but it, it was a really fun it was a fun show to work on absolutely Absolutely. So you also, speaking of creating, you also created the yep. series Splash and Bubbles and voiced one of the lead characters, yes. Splash. That's, yes. a, that's a very, again, another wonderful show, a very unique show as is. Yes. What was working on that like? Well, it was wonderful. I mean, you know, it was, it was such a um, surreal thing to, to, to get the chance to like, you know, make, so I made the show Imagine Ocean off Broadway and then it was weird to get a chance to to reimagine it for TV. Um, and what was cool about it was, you know, we shot it using the system that we have called the HTPS system, uh, which is the digital puppetry studio. And what that basically means is that, you know, it's it's uh, uh, using puppetry to, to animate. So, so there's a, you know, CG animated character that's built and rigged almost like an animatronic puppet would be. And then instead of using uh, the controls for animatronics, you're using it for animation. So we have our hands inside these rigs that, and we're puppeteering faces and we're doing all the things you would do with a soft puppet, but we're doing it with digital animation. Um, and each little finger controller creates something different, right? So, you know, my index finger, if I want it to, if I, if I point up as I open my mouth, makes an ooh shape, or if I turn my hand to the left, it makes an E, or uh, my, my left hand is doing like a joystick that has different facial expressions programmed onto it and has eye blinks and eye rolls and things like that. So we're really in real time puppeteering that animation, but we're shooting it like a regular television series with three cameras that all live inside of a digital world. Um, meanwhile, while I'm doing Splash, for example, I'm doing the face and the voice on set was Donna Kimball who had a, a, a motion capture dot covered puppet version of Splash who was puppeteering her in what we call the volume, which is like the set. And all of these cameras around the edge of it are looking at what she's doing to see where that character is supposed to be in frame. And then the computer at the same time is taking what I'm doing with the face and melding it live with what she's doing with the body to make one character. So it's a really 
insane magical system. Um, and because we shoot it like a regular TV show, you know, in real in regular animation, you go into a booth and you lay down a voice. You're usually by yourself. And then, you know, a director goes through and picks whatever takes that they liked and splices that together with another person doing another voice at another time that you never met. And then they take that, they lay out a soundtrack, they give that to the animator, the animator animates to it, and that's how it happens. With this, it's all happening at the same time. So we can change the script if we need to, we can ad lib, the director can change a shot, we can, it, it's really magical because, and that's why we try to do it all together at the same time. So you get this very kind of live performance is what I would say feel. Mm. Um, but the challenge of that is it's very difficult technically. And there's a lot of things you can do with this that you can't do. Um, so it's, it's a lot about figuring out how to stage a scene, where the digital camera can go. Um, you know, we're oftentimes puppeteering more than one character. So we're filling in for each other. Um, but it was, it was, it was, you know, we had, we did 40 half hours, which is a big order. Uh, PBS tends to order a lot of episodes at once, but so it really gave us a lot of opportunity to create amazing stories, but also like by the end of it, we had it down, you know, like we really knew, knew how to make a, an episode work, but it's really hard. It's really hard work. But it's weird because you walk on set on the soundstage and there's nothing, you know, it's just basically a blank soundstage with a bunch of motion capture cameras and these rigs for the puppets. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's weird to like watch it be filmed because we're just operating only inside of the computer. Um, but it was great. It was the right thing to do for, for an underwater show because we could oh, do yeah. things, with, you know, so it was, it was really cool. It was, it was, it was a uh, hard, hard work. But fun work again. It was Leslie and my friend Amy and Raymond Carr, who's amazing, and this incredible, incredible group of puppeteers and uh, and technicians, and and everyone just gave it their all. It was it was a very a hard hard show to do physically, but emotionally really satisfactory. Absolutely. So, moving on a bit from a uh, TV puppetry, you also performed uh, Princeton and Rod in the original yeah. Broadway production of. Avenue Q. Yay! What was what was it? What are some of your fondest memories from uh, getting to work on that? Oh gosh. Well, I mean, you know, it was my Broadway debut. It was something I dreamt about. Uh, I'd always wanted to be on Broadway. I, I, as an actor, you know, there was I was always doing both. I was always puppeteering or acting, uh, very rarely together. Um, and I had a, a very dual passion. I loved. I wanted to perform as myself as much as I wanted to puppeteer. Um, and, but I was, I would have been happy being on Broadway as like, you know, guy number six in the back. Like I didn't, I didn't have a, I didn't have a, a expectation, let alone a, um, a, a vision of being, you know, the leading character in a show. Um, and um, so at Avenue Q, like, you know, it started off as just a bunch of sketches for a potential TV show. It was going to be like a adult version of Sesame Street. And so we didn't think it was going to be a theater piece. We did it, we performed it in a theater for people because we wanted to see how people reacted to it, but it wasn't intended to be a theater piece. It was supposed to be a TV show. Um, and then the reaction back was so strong. I, I mean, I remember that first reading we did of the, of the song, we did, we did like five songs and four sketches or something like that. Um, the reaction back was so crazy. And that's kind of what started it off as a, as a theater piece. And I did all the readings, all the workshops of it. And we honestly thought maybe it would go like off Broadway for like two weeks. Like we were like, wouldn't that be cool? And then um, we got our off Broadway production and, and it was sold out almost immediately and like became like the cool show to see and they kept extending it. And like, all these celebrities were coming downtown to this little theater called the Vineyard Theater, a wonderful theater downtown coming to see it, you know? And it was like, oh, this is something special. And then we had a meeting with the producers and we thought it was going to be to extend the show again because it was so popular and they're like we're going to broadway and i was like i mean i just i remember this explosion of sound that happened in that room when they said that because it was out of the seven original cast members it was five of our broadway debut and it was just so unexpected and magical i remember calling my parents crying i was like i'm gonna be on broadway um and of course being the insecure person i am i was convinced it took about two weeks to believe it but i was like they're going to replace me with like Neil Patrick Harris, right? They're going to replace, there's no way they're going to let me be the star of a Broadway show. There's no way. Um, but they did. And, and I remember 
opening night of the show, I really believe in the power of positive thinking and manifestation. Even before it was like the cool thing to do, I was like, even as a kid, I would, I mean, I'm convinced that that's why I got to work with the Muppets eventually is because I just believed it would happen so much. Um, I'd had this vision when I was like 18, when I first moved to New York City and I was auditioning for theater as well as doing Muppet stuff, I had this vision standing in my living room of like what it would feel like standing on a Broadway stage with the spotlight on me, looking out at the audience and feeling that moment. And it was so weird because that night, opening night, I walked out on stage to do the first part of the show. The first lines in the show are Princeton. I'm the first character on stage. And the spotlight came up and it was exactly how I'd imagined it. It was this weird, like, like I had seen that moment and, and it felt the same, it smelled the same, it looked the same, everything I pictured, it felt the same. The only difference was I had a puppet on my hand. <laughs> that part I had not right. manifested because who would know? But um, but it was it was a really, that was a really magical moment. But um, yeah, I mean, that show changed my life. I mean, I would not be sitting here with you right now if it weren't for that show, because I it, it is the reason why Johnny and the Sprites happened, it's the reason why Imagine Ocean happened. It's the reason why Shrek and Beauty and the Beast happened. It's the reason why everything has happened since then. So it really, it, 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 I went from being, you know, an assistant, fairly anonymous puppeteer to suddenly being the star of a show and my face was everywhere, you know, and all of a sudden people knew my name. And it was very, that was a big adjustment to make at first. Um, you know, I remember being on the subway and it was weird to like, you know, be like haggard and like, you know, in sweatpants and, it's cold and I'm grumpy because I didn't sleep the night before or whatever and look up and there's my face on a on a poster and I'd be like oh god no one look at me <laughs> yeah. but it was but it was it was a very it was magic and it was just you know to have you know all these incredible celebrities and people coming to you and saying like that they're fans and that they're they love the show I mean that was just the most surreal experience of my life um but it was wonderful and it, and it was you know Anne Harada who played Christmas Eve in the show used to always say like we're, we're the little show that could you know, because we were, we were this little show, this weird little show that no one ever thought would go to Broadway. That I mean, so many people, when they say we were going to open on Broadway, they were, they were writing articles in newspapers. Think how weird this would be, right? To wake up and see something you're working on written about in a newspaper and people are saying how much of a failure it's going to be, right? Like, it was so weird. It was such a weird thing. And so we really, I, I remember, you know, from first preview on Broadway to opening night, I was like, love every moment of this because it could have it could all close tomorrow right there are broadway shows that open on opening night and close the next day so i was like let's just enjoy it every moment i can and and i'm glad i i did because it's like a swirl you know it's there's just so much happening you, you it's hard to almost take it all in right yes, absolutely yeah avenue q is such a wonderful wonderful mus musical um um i want to talk about like i want to quickly mention nate beagle because because you know, because I know he was, you know, he's a good, great friend of ours. You know, you mentioned about Imagine Ocean. You now he was kind of got started puppetry because of you. you know? I've had a few people say that, which is which is really weird to me, honestly. Like when people say <laughs> like, they became puppeteers because of me, I, I, it's it's very weird because it's like you know I don't. It's hard to see me like that because for me I look at my heroes. You know what I mean? Like, the, and that's still who I look to. You know, and so it's. It's wonderful to think that there are people out there who were influenced by what I do. And, um, you know, and it, and it makes me happy because I feel like I remember finding that world of puppetry at a very young age and feeling so like right and safe there and feeling like that was my my thing, um, you know? And so if I, if that's, if I've inspired someone else to feel that way. Like that's the greatest thing I can possibly think of. And I, and I really, I, I, uh, mm -hmm. it's not that I'm deflecting that. It's just, it's hard right. to like, it's hard to like, I, cause I still see myself as I'm just John. It's weird to think of it like that. You know, I, I will say I had a beautiful moment. Um, so I'm, I'm part of this new show on Broadway uh, called How to Dance in Ohio. I'm yes. One of the, yes, yeah. he actually oh, yeah. has Connor there. Yes, yes. yes. And, he, uh, and Connor's great. Connor reached out, you know, probably, I don't know, like six months ago, whatever it was, maybe a little longer, just saying that he was a big fan and stuff like that. And and I was mm -hmm. so, you know, and um, but I didn't realize how much I 
it had affected him. I didn't know this, you know, really until someone sent me a video of him talking about it. And I was like, what? Like, I just didn't know. And so to, to then go see him in his Broadway debut and get to support that and to see that was just a really like, I was just, I remember just being very thankful and just feeling very like, you know, that's the beautiful part of when you get to do something like this is that if, if you know that the work you're doing that you're really just doing because you want to hopefully make a difference and make good stuff that it, if it can make someone feel great and can influence their careers and, and make them want to pursue something, then that's, that's everything. That's everything. So, so that Connor was a really recent example of like, you know, yes. he was so he was so speechful to see it. Like he didn't he know you were there. Is. He was. <laughs> I, mean, I saw your story. He kept it super out. secret. He did not know I was there, and I and I was actually. Sitting I think you're like, like hi. I was like, yeah. <laughs> that was not stage. That was a very. Genuine. I know. I know. Yeah. Oh, right. yeah. 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 That's yeah, you, wow. You just being yes. you, and then Connor just being surprised that you, that you were there. Right. It was so sweet. It was so sweet. Yeah, yeah. He, by the way, he's amazing in the show. Everyone should go see the show. He's amazing. In the show. Everyone's oh, amazing. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. yeah the yeah. performance in the Macy's parade was amazing. For oh yeah, yeah. it was so Ohio. great. He, he yeah. was watching the moonwalk. It was so great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, it you mentioned. So great. Oh yeah, 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 that's great. So, <laughs> yes, as we're kind of getting close to our wrapping up, what was the uh, process like of getting Gobo? Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, you can imagine. You know, I mean. Jerry's work and Fraggle Rock is you guys know you you you've you already know you know when we wrap Johnny the Sprite so you must I'm sure you read that that you know that that, that Fraggle Rock is my all time favorite biggest inspiration yes um, and Absolutely. I would say you know and what I always tell this this is a true story when I first found Fraggle Rock uh, we, my mom and I were on a trip down to see my grandmother in Tennessee we were at a motel that had free HBO which is a big deal back in the day. And the very first, when my mom turned on the TV and Fraggle Rock came on, the very first puppet I saw was Gobo. So, so I was instantly, I always like, that was my first image and first portal into the world of Fraggle Rock. Um, and of course, Jerry is a legend and, and, you know, he, he, he was Gobo in the, mm -hmm. in the time work with him. I mean, he was this wise leader and, and had, you know, was playing his guitar all the time in the Muppet room and was just, he, he was a leader and he, that, that's who he was. Um, and, but I love, I always love that character. And, um, you know, of course, I, I, Jerry passed in 2012, if I remember yeah. correctly, yeah. which was horrible. Yeah, right. yeah. 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 And it was, it was shocking and it was sad and it was horrible. And, um, in 2013, uh, I think that the Fraggle Rock was going to be on the hub, which was this network that. Yeah. Was, see, actually like you and Karen actually did some hub, uh, Yes. promos yeah. too that was the very first thing i ever did is gobo and that that was what oh, the wow. audition for was to basically like they needed someone to play the character because they were going to do these promos and um you know they thought maybe that there'd be some more opportunities and i think i think it was also like the anniversary year of the show i think it was like the 30th anniversary yeah, 30th, yeah. yeah 30th. Uh -huh, that's right mm -hmm. i think they were thinking they were going to do stuff so they, they needed someone to play gobo and i was so scared. I was so nervous to uh, be auditioning for it. Um, and I was also so excited. And um, I wa actually watched my original audition not too long ago and it was horrible, it was horrible. Like I don't sound right. I, I was just, I was so nervous, but they saw something in it. They saw, I think, frankly, I think it was because I was such a, I had such, so much nerd knowledge of like the show that like on the improv section, I could like tell you everything and I would like, I think they asked me about like Uncle Traveling Matt and I was telling all these stories about Uncle Matt and, and the radishes and silly creatures and the, ca the cave of wonders and you name it. And so I think they saw that and they're like, okay, like that's, we need that. And so it gave me time to work on the voice and work on the character. But um, yeah, then literally like three weeks later we were shooting those, those hub promos. And Karen, I had known for a few years, you know, through various projects, we never really worked mm -hmm. together, worked together. Um, she did the Muppet, the Sesame Street for you movie, but that was it. That was, that was the only thing I ever worked on with her. And I was so, I remember the night before they'd given me the puppet to rehearse with. And I remember the night before I was, he was like sitting on the, the bed of the hotel room that I was staying in here in LA at the time. And I remember just shaking and I was just like, oh my God, oh my God. And I kept putting it on and looking in the mirror. I kept like over rehearsing and overthinking and over everything. And got on set the next day on, on the first day and Karen is just the most wonderful, warm, welcoming human being on this earth. She's wonderful. And she made me feel so safe and comfortable. And 
at one point we just started ad living back and forth as Gobo and Red, and it got and I I wasn't thinking, you know, I wasn't like I got to be funny or I got to do. I just was being, and it was a really surreal out of body moment where it was like it felt so natural and it felt like I I was because of my childhood obsession with the show and because it's driven everything I've done basically since then it's almost like it led to that moment like I was like rehearsing my whole life for that moment if that makes any sense yeah. and and I remember at one point Karen was like oh my god she's like that was amazing like like and that's all I needed I was like that's it I could die now um, you know, but just to, to know that Karen as Red thought that my gobo was okay. And then, yeah, and that was the beginning. That was the very first thing we did. And then from there, it was just a lot of more like appearances and opportunities. Um, and then the series happened. So it, it's just been this. Yes. I'm, I'm really thankful, though, that, you know, I didn't get that character like the first day of the first season of the Apple TV show. I'm glad that I had, you know, years, like eight years, nine years yeah. before I had to do it on a big scale. Mm -hmm. to get to you know push myself and learn and and get more jerryisms and more you know uh, little little sounds and things and amazing things that he did on the show that i got to kind of try to work in um yes yeah absolutely of course of course um speaking of uh fraggle rock back to the rock first yeah. off congratulations on the emmy nominations by yes. the way yes thank you yes, yes. 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 second year in a row um yes. it's a wonderful big, absolutely big wonderful sir. show big congrats well thank deserved you. uh in addition to performing gobo you also write and produce on the show as well yeah what is working on that show like yeah like getting to you know just getting bring back to, this such an iconic back. you know Henson it's so it's so, sur I mean, really, it's surreal. I, I cried probably almost every day the first season because I just was so, like, uh, excited uh, and overwhelmed and nervous. And, and you know, it just didn't feel real the first couple of weeks. It was so, the very first thing we shot actually was Doc and Sprocket. We had to, because it was COVID, we had to shoot, um, it was the height of COVID, too, when we shot that show. We had to shoot all of the Doc and Sprocket stuff for all 13 episodes at once yeah. because we could only have Lily perform Doc, you know, it was just to get into Canada and out of Canada was a big thing during COVID. Mm -hmm. So we had to shoot all the Doc and Sprockets at once. So the very first thing we did was shoot Doc and Sprocket. And, you know, I was so excited to play Sprocket. And, and it was so weird. It was so weird because it was like, you know, that set very much so is reflective of the original with where the Fraggle Hole is and the design, our, our brilliant, production designer took the original set and basically just modeled Doc's new version of it off of that. So that's why like the door is exactly, everything's pretty much the same in that way. Um, so it was this weird like alternate universe I felt like I was in where I was like, oh my God, like I'm on the set of Fraggle Rock, but it's a new Fraggle Rock. Um, but it was really good to have that time to ease into it with Sprocket, like if that was the first thing we did, but it was, it was, just felt like I was in a dream. It felt like I was, I was in a weird out of body experience. Um, but it's it was the hardest thing I've ever done without without being dramatic. I mean, it was just, you know, we had three sound stages, mm -hmm. giant sound stages to shoot on because the show needs it. And when you really see like the Gorgs set, like it takes up an entire sound stage. It's massive. Um, and it's, you know, at, at any given time on a normal day, there was, you know, 25 puppeteers working that that, you know, I was responsible for ultimately. Um, and you know, these giant sets and huge special effects and musical numbers and and complicated camera work and scenes. And it's it's just uh it it was I I've never had a TV series, and I think it's because I played multiple uh I served multiple purposes on it, you know, as a producer, as a writer, as a but I would go home and just be like it, you know, it's like it's, and I remember Frank Meshkalite, who a puppeteer of Uber for the for the show. Of course, Dave did the voice, but Frank puppeteer. But Frank worked on the original. He was the last season junior Gorg and a uh, background puppeteer. He said, "You know, the original series was was like this too. It take the work takes so much from you, but you want to give everything you've got into it." And it's so true. It's like it's it's the hardest physical work and the hardest mental work I've ever done. But it was but you just felt so proud at the end of every day and you felt so good about the work you did. Um, but it was, it was everyone working at their highest level is the way I would put it. It's like every, and, that, and that's what the original series was known for. You know, if you talk to 
Karen or Dave or anybody who works in the original series, it was like everyone always operated at their highest level and every department felt that their contribution was just as important and it was. So that's why you'd see all those little details in the back in the original series of the doozers. Like even if it wasn't a doozer episode, they would still come up with little storylines and scenarios for the doozers. Same thing for this for this version. Like everyone, like the, I remember the props department, like they'd be so they'd be so wonderfully proud of like a radish milkshake that they made that looked incredible. That was going to be on camera for three seconds, but it was immaculate and perfect and looked real. And everyone just cared so deeply. Um, and there was a lot of a lot of happy tears shed. You know, shooting in Canada with a mostly Canadian crew and puppeteer pool. They all grew up on the show. So it was very, I remember the first day we pulled the puppets out in front of the crew and there was just this like, you know, you watch all these like very like burly Canadian crew guys just completely go like, oh, like just completely melt, you know? And that was, that was really wonderful to see. Uh, uh, oh. But it was, it was magic. And I, I remember the, the very last day of shooting the first season, uh, it was the holiday episode that we're, that we're nominated for now. And yeah, I remember- yes, Night of the Lights. Night of the Lights. Such a beautiful, wonderful, wonderful special. Beautiful special. So beautiful. wonderful. So it great. Was, it, was, it was nice to end that first year with that, you know? Um, and again, we had no idea if we'd be successful, if people would want to watch it, if it would get renewed. But we had this beautiful full circle puppeteer moment. And, and it was just, we were just all sobbing. Like <laughs> just sobbing. And it was this wonderful cathartic thing about, cause you know, it was a very, it, shooting during COVID made it really difficult in many ways cause we were in masks most of the time which also made it really tiring, but it was scary, right? The world was scary at that time. It was like, will life ever be normal? Will we ever be able to gather in a crowd really? I mean, for most of us shooting that show was the first time we've been with more than a handful of people in over a year, right? So it was, it was a very, emotional first season for that reason um but i remember you know it, it, it it's like we would it we shot in this cement building and it felt like we were going to fraggle rock every day getting away from the scary real world into this very safe beautiful place so it was we were crying because we were proud we were crying because we were going to miss each other we were also crying because we were scared and we were we were we were sad to leave this magical you know kind of utopia that we had created mm. to go back to the real world and and it was um you know i i some of the crew on that show i mean we had the best crew in the world and so many of them you know would work worked on have worked on so many shows up there and they're like this is the best job i've ever had in my life and when you hear that and you know that you got to play a part in that it's just wonderful it's a wonderful feeling to to know that like people would come to work and be so happy to be there, you know, cause that's not always the case, you know, especially movie and television work. It can be really drudging, drudgery and boring and hard, especially for the crew that the crew always works harder than anybody else. And, you know, to see them get excited, to have the characters have ridiculous, like off camera storylines with crew members and things like that. It was great. It was just, it was a, it was a really um, powerful experience. And I'm really thankful for it. And then of course you get a chance go back and do the second season and, and, you know, get to make more and be together again. That was just, that was just wonderful. Yes, absolutely. We're very yeah, excited yeah, for yeah, season two. Yes. Yes. Me very too. looking forward to it. Yeah. Yep. I'm, I'm excited for you guys. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We, we, yes. Have, we are too. Um, yeah. Back to Rock. It's, it's such a wonderful series for this, you know, especially for a new generation, you know. I oh, yeah. Thank so, you. So wonderful. Thank you. Rock and Rock, we come back for the new generation of kids, you know, joy, you know, because of what you know, what you guys are doing is just so wonderful. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'm yes. very, very proud of it. Of course, and um, yes. and, and if and if it's fine, um, is it fine if we can hear a bit of Gobo? Oh, sure. Well, uh, what do you want to hear? Mm -hmm. Oh, it's nice to be here, eh? Uh, well, you know, I was off exploring the caves with Wembley, and you know, I heard you guys were doing this uh, something silly creature called podcast or something. I'm I'm not really sure, but or is it a? I'm not even sure if that's what it's called. But anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm going to probably go to the Great Hall and get some doozer sticks and go to the Gorks Garden. I don't know. Get a postcard. Uh, that's great. Postcard was actually the first word that I, I was like, I was like, I got to nail the way Jerry would say postcard because you would say it with like postcard. It's this very like specific way, this very Toronto accent. So I was like, yeah, I can, right. I can maybe yes. find that Canadian sound, but. Yes. <laughs> yes. Hey, I'm, 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 how's Frog Rock been, been doing? 
down there. Oh, uh, not bad, you know, but we, we kind of miss everybody, you know. It's been kind of quiet. So uh, uh, yeah. i just been playing my gourd guitar in my room, and Wembley comes by, and, you know, we have sing-alongs. It's nice. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. so weird. I haven't done the voice like without the puppet in so long. I'm like, what's happening? Yeah. Right. Uh, 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 so if you're wondering why, why Matt is kind of tear up, because he's been a fan of Gobo for like 16 years. Almost 16 years. Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, oh my that's gosh. A that's a, he's, he's been my favorite for almost 16 years. And that's, that's just a childhood dream come true right there. Oh, Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Oh my gosh. I don't I don't usually I don't usually get this emotional on this show, but that that's a childhood dream come true right there for me. Oh, I wish I'm glad you didn't tell me. I would have been so much more nervous doing it. Well, I <laughs> I would have been like, oh, God, don't mess this up. So to end this off, so this podcast is called uh, Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show. When you think of nostalgia, what do you think of or how would you define nostalgia? Oh, me? Oh, yeah. gosh. I love nostalgia. I mean, I'm, I'm definitely a... Uh, uh, I, I, I love those, f- those moments when you have that, um, that overwhelming strong memory of something that just brought you joy or made you feel safe for me. Like, you know, I, I, Disney world is like that for me. Like that was a very important part of my life going there with my parents. And um, it was an escape for me, you know? And so like a lot of like older, like videos of like Epcot or like things that I experienced as a kid, when I see that it makes me super nostalgic watching them up at family Christmas. That was my favorite Christmas special of all time still is. So whenever I watch that, I, I have these pangs of like, like the heartwarming moments and, and just, it feels good and safe uh yeah i don't know nostalgia to me is like it's a really healthy thing to feel i think it's important to like remember those things that you know those pockets in your life that felt safe or felt good or felt impactful um but i love it i love i love looking back at stuff you know yeah. it, it, it's, it's it's important not to get lost in that because then you can get really sad because it's not there anymore it's not right active but I think it's important to like keep that. I mean, I'm convinced that's why Fraggle Rock happened was because I was, I've been such a, you know, had such nostalgia for the original series that it was like, no, we got to make it happen again. So I think, I think it can also drive you to create new things that, you know, will hopefully, like you were saying about, you know, Johnny and the Sprites or like, like you know, it was something that was impactful to you. So like, you know, I didn't think that when we were making it, but if that becomes something that's nostalgic for people because it, it it's a happy memory from the childhood, then like, I love that. So I think it's I think I think nostalgia is really, really powerful and it's important. Absolutely, great words said, John. Thank you. Yes, awesome. Well, John, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. This was a blast. Glad we were finally able to make it happen. I know the scheduling and everything. You know, there's been some issues, but I'm glad we were finally able to make it happen. Man, this was thank you. You guys have been yes, and and, 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 yes, and thank you very much for for taking the time to do this and for what you're doing. You know, it's been a part of our lives, and really appreciate for you coming on and you know and keep up a great work. What's going on with Frog Walk and everything else? And and I can't wait to see store for you. Fingers crossed, it wins. I hope so. Yes. Yes. Fingers crossed. (laughs) Fingers crossed. When the second season comes on, spread the word. We want everyone to watch it. So we yes. we will definitely <laughs> spread the yes. word for sure. We yes. definitely will. Watch, watch it. Second season. Watch it. Second season. Watch it. Second, yes. second season, whenever it comes out. <laughs> whenever it may be. That's yes. the one. That's the number one thing we have to do when it's going to be there. Come you out. Go. We know in the promo. I'll tell you what. Next time I'll come back and I'll tell you once it's out. I'll tell you stories about season two. So that that's what we'll All do. Right. Oh yeah, nice. we'd love to have yeah. you back. Yes, yes, yes absolutely. Yes, well, enjoy the rest of your day, John. Uh, you know, Thank you. Again, you've been Thank a part you. of our lives for so long, and yes, you know, yes. what's next in store for you? Yes. Thank you, guys. I really, really am thankful. I'm really, I'm, I'm glad you asked me to do this, and thank you for being so patient. I really, yes, of course. Absolutely. Of course. Enjoy course. the rest of your day, John. All right, I'll let you know when this goes up. Take care, oh yeah, please do. I'll yes. talk to you soon. See All right, bye. 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 See ya. It's goodbye from us as well. We absolutely enjoy our time with John Tartaglia. Keep on the lookout for wonderful interviews coming your way. And as always, what do we say, Jake? Keep nostalgia alive. And if you want, if you, if you want to check out his his social media, it's going to be in the description down below. And as well as his know, website and his yes. website, yes, and everything else he's been done over the years. And I hope we will see you in the <laughs> second season. Um, well, come and um, you know, hope you can have him on again to talk about that. Oh, and we until definitely then, will. We will definitely have him on. Yes, yes. But until then, we can keep looking forward for wonderful more episodes coming your way. As always. Like I always say, keep nostalgia alive. Take care, everyone. See you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you for tuning in to another wonderful Jake's Happy Nostalgia Show interview. 
Be sure to follow Jake and the crew on social media and stream the show wherever you find your favorite podcasts. And as always, remember to keep nostalgia alive. Bye-bye.